Thank you very much. So this morning I will talk to you about the principles and techniques of cardiac CT. Now, of course, in 15 minutes I won't have time to go into the physics and mathematics of you know how it works. Uh, what I will try to do instead is to illustrate as best as I can the basic principles using nice graphics so that you can understand how it works and then be able to understand the limitations of the technique. So we will go through several aspects of the principle and uh, several important topics and at the end I will go over a few major protocols that we use for cardiac CT. Now, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with the principles of helical scanning. Basically, you have a patient that lies on a table, and around the patient is a big ring called a gantry. In this gantry, on one side is a source of x-rays, and on the other side is an array of detectors. And the gantry rotates around the patient at a constant speed. And so the x-rays will hit the patients from different angles and be captured by the detectors. And so what CT produces is an attenuation map of x-rays by the patient uh, from a different angles. Now, at the same time as the gantry rotates around the patient, the table moves through the gantry at a constant speed. And so we end up with what is called a helical data set of attenuation information through the patient. Now, the table can move at different speeds. If the table uh, moves or advances by exactly one width of the detector array, uh, every rotation of the gantry, then you have a pitch of one. So basically, there's neither gaps nor overlaps in the helical data set. If the table moves faster, then you will have gaps in the helical data set. And if the table moves slower, then you will have overlaps in the helical data set. Cardiac CT is performed using very, very low pitch, so typically 0.2 to 0.3. That means that the data is highly overlapped. Why is that so? That's because we're not only interested to look at anatomy of the heart, but we also want to image the heart at every single point in its cardiac cycle. And so we have to go slowly through that. Now, what uh, do you do with uh, that um, helical data set of projection? First of all, here, again, illustrated was the source of x-rays on one side of the gantry. And here, basically, it represented is the array of detectors. Now, these array of detectors can have uh, different configurations depending on the actual machine that you're using. Uh, the array has a certain number of rows that varies from detector, from scanner to scanner. For example, you have one row scanners, you have 16 row scanners, you have 64 row scanners. And uh, then there's also a certain uh, a number of um, detectors and the column wise. Typically, uh, there's going to be, say, for example, 16 rows of scanner by something like 800 or 900 detectors. Uh, the other dimension, the kind of larger dimension of the array is entirely determined by the width of the detector to make sure that there's enough coverage to capture all the photons that get transmitted through the patient. Now, different vendors have different configurations of scanners. This is a kind of a sample of the scanners available from the major vendors. So typically, uh, in modern scanners, you will have a number of rows that vary between 16 and 64. And in the future, there's going to be more than 64. Rotation time of the gantry uh, varies right now between one third of a second and one half of a second. And the size of the detectors on the detector array vary from you know, 0.4 millimeter to 0.75 millimeters, so sub-millimeter resolution in all scanners. Now, what's the difference between, say, a single-row scanner, a 64-row scanner, or a 16-row scanner uh, in terms of cardiac imaging? Well, the main difference is the speed of imaging. When uh, we were scanning the heart using a single-size scanner a couple of years ago, it took several minutes to acquire the data. Now, with the advent of the 16-slice scanner, what we could do is to actually acquire the entire data within one breath hold. So that was a major improvement. 
in terms of cardiac scanning. And with the more modern scanners, for example, 64 slice scanner, you need about uh, five to seven seconds to acquire the entire data set. So a very, very short breath hold. Now you have this helical data set. What do you do with that? Well, you have to reconstruct images. Uh, how do you do that? Well, you can reconstruct images along any plane that you want. Basically, the helical data set represents kind of, you know, is used to generate volumetric data. And so to generate a specific image along a specific plane, you simply do interpolation of the data from the detectors that were along that plane when uh, the patient gets scanned, and so you end up with an image. Now, besides be able to reconstruct images in any plane that you want, you can reconstruct images at any phase of the cardiac cycle that you want, because remember, the helical data set for cardiac CT is highly overlapped. We have information about the entire heart over the entire cardiac cycle. And so you can reconstruct images in systole, such as the one on the left, and images in diastole, such as the one on the right, as well as anywhere in between. We're able to do that simply because as the data is acquired, the EKG signal from the patient is also acquired at the same time. So the scanner knows at every single point in time where the patient is in its cardiac cycle. And so from that, we can also generate uh, multiphasic data representing the heart at different points in its cardiac cycle. Typically, we generate 20 phases of data, and we use that to look at uh, functional uh, aspects of the heart, such as, for example, contraction of the left ventricle, wall thickening, uh, and uh, you know, ejection fraction computation. Now, overall, that's basically kind of a very quick overview of you know, how we can generate the data. Now, I would like to focus on four very, very important points that kind of distinguish cardiac CT from other modalities. The first one is that cardiac CT is tomographic imaging. And so that's very different from, say, a chest X-ray. When you do a chest X-ray, you send X-rays to the, to the patient in a fraction of a second, and so you have an instant snapshot of you know, the anatomy of the patient. In CT, basically, the gantry rotates around the patient, and mathematically, to generate an image, you need to accumulate 180 degree of projection data. Well, what does that mean? That means that the gantry has to rotate half a rotation to have enough data to generate one image. Well, it takes time to go through half a rotation. We said that the rotation time from modern scanners was between one third and one uh, fourth of a second or one half of a second. Then half a rotation, that's gonna be between one sixth of a second to one fourth of a second. That means that the data that is used to generate an image Say, for example, you want to generate an image at 70% of the RR interval. Well, the data that will be used to generate that image will span from, say, 60% of the RR interval to 80% of the RR interval. So this is not an instant snapshot. Now, if you generate an image in diastole, of course, the heart during that period doesn't move much. And so even if the temporal resolution is not that great, you will generate great images because the heart doesn't move much. Whereas if you try to generate images in systole, say, for example, around 10% of the R interval, then during that kind of small period of time, the heart will have moved quite a bit. And so the images will be more blurry. Now, what can we do about that? Well, there's different ways to improve temporal resolution on the images. First of all, you can make the gantry rotate faster. And the problem is that right now the gantry weighs several thousand pounds and we're getting close to reaching the engineering limitations of making that you know, thing weighing you know, a couple of thousand pounds rotate as fast as possible. And so in the later scanners, what we'll see is very, very small improvements in uh, kind of a gantry rotation speed. Another way that we can use to improve temporal resolution is as follow. Given that the helical data set is highly overlapped, what we can do instead of taking, you know, half a rotation worth of projection,